Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. And this is Ellen in St. Bart's. And today it's all about solving design problems, queuing, where to hang the lights, and finding an assistant lighting designer, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers. And sister. You better believe that. (laughs) That's right. You've got Steve, Ellen, and me today. Uh, Boy, wasn't it nice to have Brackley on last week, Steve and Ellen? It was. He is great. He's got got that FM voice, too. He does. You know, and he's a lot calmer now. He's not so freaked out. You know? Well, that, that comes with, with age. And retirement. He's, he's like a fine wine. He's a fine wine. Now, what did we say? He's the, uh, the mimosa of Light Talk. Or, yes. Right. He's the mimosa. So that's a wonderful thing to have. Did you know that um, Broccoli and I have the same birthday? Oh, no. Really? Yes. We are fellow Capricorns. January 12th. Wow. You know, if you come to the Light Talk session at LDI uh, and go up to Brackley and identify yourself, he will buy you dinner. Yeah, he will. And, and a couple of drinks. Because <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah, He's a stand-up yeah. guy. Yeah, but, but you also have to drink mimosas. He only drinks mimosas. So that's the problem. Anyway, welcome everyone to episode 339. Before we start, this big news. There's huge news. The Writers Guild has ended the strike. They've agreed. Well, did they sign? Well, no, sign, they haven't signed yet, but, but they've taken down the picketers. They are not picketing anymore, and I guess they're going back to work. Well, we don't know yet. Are they going to still honor, though, the Screen Actors Guild? They have to. Right. They have, they have, they have, to. have nobody I mean, to write for. The <laughs> SAG, SAG didn't cross their line. That's right. I mean, they, they're I mean, gonna, but I think SAG, SAG will probably be happy in about a week. Yeah, well, we'll see. Okay. And they, they think they can wait the uh, the uh, actors out, but we, we'll find out for sure. Anyway, so that's the big news of the day. And let's get started. Steve has our first listener question. It is Angie in Montana. And she asks, what is your process for queuing lights during a production? Well, you know, I looked at that question and I thought there's a couple different ways to answer this. So I'll answer it both ways. Uh, first, uh, when I'm creating a light plot, I'm kind of queuing the show as I go right then, because I kind of look at what do I need for page one, and I design that. What do I need for page two? I'm working with an assistant, and we're starting to create a rough queue list during that process as I'm developing the show. You know, I usually start uh, by blocking out major lighting changes and then fill in the details as needed. And of course, I like to work with the director during the rehearsal process to be in the room with them and see what they're doing and chat about uh, some options we might have. So that's one way. Now, the question says process for queuing lights during a production. So I'm going to assume you're asking, do I work over rehearsal? And sure, absolutely, I work over rehearsal. I'm, I'm sensitive to uh, not being a distraction to the director or the actors, and I certainly don't just black people out. But yes, I, I like working over rehearsal. I like watching the evolution uh, of once the director gets into the theater. And frankly, at a lot of, um, um, I'm not a Broadway designer, so a lot of the theaters I work at are university or smaller theaters. And I think the rehearsal room is just a, a suggestion of what the director is going to do. They walk onto stage and all of a sudden they have the set, they have the furniture, and they start effectively reblocking the show. They start expanding and contracting as the, as the stage allows them. So I find working over rehearsal pretty vital, and it allows us to get a few days jump on the show before we start the dreaded tech rehearsal. What about you, David? Well, uh, what is your process for queuing? <laughs> I agree with you, Steve. I mean, working over rehearsals is fabulous when you have the opportunity to do that. Uh, but, you know, I start queuing when I first read the script, to tell you the truth. I break down the show into what's called a design score. And it's basically, you know, what how the show is composed. 
as far as scenes, transitions, music, uh, dramatic moments, dramatic actions. I actually, you know, jot this down. I teach my students how to do this, too, because it helps them understand how a play is structured. So uh, I start from the very beginning, and then uh, I, it continues on, like Steve was talking about, in rehearsals. But even in the, in the staging rehearsals I attend, if I can, I usually get there usually a week before I focus and uh, I sit in rehearsals and I watch what the director's doing. Obviously, we've been talking all this time, depending on how long the production process, the design process has been going on. Um, sometimes it takes several years. Uh, <laughs> uh, and sometimes it's quick too, you never know. Um, but I watch these rehearsals and I envision the space in my mind's eye and as the actors walk through this uh, rehearsal room, I imagine what the set looks like. I imagine what the atmosphere is. I imagine where the motivated lighting is, you know, where, where different colors are, what, the, you know, what we were talking about. And then I get new ideas and more ideas as I see actually how the actors are going through it. And then, as Steve mentioned, uh, then it's a matter of putting the stuff in the board <laughs> and, then, uh, and then working over rehearsals and then allowing that. Uh, process to be flexible and to change and understanding that that pathway, that journey of, of uh, developing a stage lighting design is always fluid and could change all the way up to opening night and sometimes past it. So that's, that's how I do it. Uh, now, again, if you're doing something like a real quick one-off or you're doing like a concert where you have very little time, then, you know, it's, it's uh, changes. You obviously, are, the time is compressed. But I, you know, I, that's why you know, once I started working in Europe, I got really spoiled. <laughs> you know, being able to be in the theater for six weeks, you know, lighting a show is, is a lot different from being in the theater for three days and lighting a show. So that's, uh, that, that's the way it is. So it depends on what you're doing. At what point do you start imagining the colors? When I'm uh, reading the play, I think about color. Like I would think about what instrument to play whatever part I'm composing. Like, you know, maybe I want a violin doing it, or I want a piccolo doing it, or I want a piano doing it. There are colors and all that type of sound. You do the same thing, you know, in, in lighting. So, you know, is this a blue feel? Is this a, a, a red blue feel? Is it a green blue feel? Is this like a, a dynamic feel or is it a clear feel? Uh, you know, it's a lot, you, you do it all the way through. It's just, you got to have a starting point <laughs> and then you can change it as, as you go. But yeah, that starting point happens from the very beginning for me. And look, everyone works differently and that's cool because everybody's different, but this is just how it's always worked for me. Do you have to often or ever have to change once you see the sets and costumes? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, once once you're talking to, uh, you know, the other collaborators and, you know, you're all talking about color palettes and things like that, that may change, be a radical change from what I originally envisioned when I first read the script or listened to the music. Uh, and that's OK, because then I, you know, then you just say, OK, this is our new direction. Or we talk about it, maybe they come over to my green-blue idea instead of their red-blue idea. But it's a collaborative process. Um, and uh, yeah, sometimes you have to change. But again, change is good and happens all the way up to opening night. It's not a bad thing. Um, if I can put in a plug for some friends here um, at the Studio School of Design in New York, they have three courses coming up about queuing. One by Natasha Katz, one by Jennifer Tipton, and one by Mark Stanley. And I think they are in live, uh, in-person live classes in New York. And um, you can go on their website, Studio School of Design, and get all the information about that. But that's three really top name lighting designers who are going to share their thoughts about queuing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool. Uh, you know, you don't have to sell sell me on that uh, school. That's <laughs> to me. That's that's where it's happening right now. I think you know because they have the best teachers, and uh, you know, you don't get the the um, the production experience that you would get in a university, and which is why I think that the studio school design is a great additional. Uh, source of education that you can get concurrent with the university training you're getting and actually creating theater and laboratories. And you get access to that kind of designer. 
My question is from Jason in Orlando, who asks, what is the best way to learn how to program a specific lighting console? Now, he didn't specify which, but to sort of toot my own horn a little bit here, a great way to learn to program specific lighting consoles is at LDI, the trade show, or I suppose other trade shows uh, around the world as well. Um, at LDI, we have training on probably six or seven different consoles this year, um, from straight up hands-on uh, training classes to an exciting new thing called Battle of the Busk, where teams of two people on lighting and teams of two people on video will learn to busk on a specific console. There are five different ones involved. Um, also, I think most of the manufacturers offer online training as well as in-person training. So if you know which specific console you want to learn about, you could either do it at LDI, USITT, or a different trade show, or check with the manufacturer and see when they are training. Um, you guys have other options? Well, it never hurts just to sit down, um, dare I say, with the owner's manual and find something you've never done and just see how that particular process works. Owner's manual, blasphemy. Who has picked up an owner's right. manual? <laughs> Who has written a good owner's manual? You know, uh, I actually, I know the answer to this. You guys know the answer to this as well. Ann McMills. Didn't she write the owner's manual for one of the uh, Strand? No, it wasn't the Strand. I think it was an ETC board. Or am I thinking of Maybe. someone else? Ann Valentino. Ann Valentino. Yeah. Okay. Right. Ann Valentino. Okay. <laughs> yes, call Ann Valentino. She'll teach you anything you That's need to know. Right. Ann Valentino products. did that. Right. right. Uh, now, what you suggested, Ellen, is are all great, great. Uh, sources and what Steve suggested about you know going to the manufacturer uh, is is terrific too. If you're in a city, if you're living in LA or New York or anywhere where there's uh, a strong uh, live entertainment industry, then yeah, you're going to find people that are going to be able to teach you this. Uh, but if you're living in a smaller city, maybe a little more difficult. And if you're going to school in one of these smaller towns, you may want to talk to your professor because your professor may then be able to arrange training at the university. I know Stan has done this. I, we, actually, all three of us have done this. And they, they'll send somebody down to train the entire class of people. And it's very, very effective. We even did that here in L.A. I mean, uh, I had my students train the M.A. on site uh, at the uh, manufacturer's uh, location. And then we had uh, ETC come down and train the students on the hog uh, here at school. So, you know, it just depends on how it works. Even though ETC does have an, a very large and very beautiful L.A. Um, office, but you can certainly learn it on your computer. You can get uh, the software downloaded and learn it for free. And you can also do it on uh, YouTube. There are training uh, programs on YouTube as well. Well, Accentra from UK. I love that name, Accentra. I never heard that name before. <laughs> Accentra from the UK asks, what do you do when you get the plans for a theater and there are no overhead lighting positions? Scream. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use overhead lighting. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 one you don't have to have lights overhead you can have lights at low angles and you know but uh <laughs> there are there are ways there are ways first go first of all you got to find out why there are no overhead lighting positions and if you can install some type of lighting truss work either by hanging it from a uh, ceiling points or actually have it floor supported um, that's another possibility. Uh, but if none of that's possible, then you really need to rethink the lighting and you need to come in from lower angles. Or the side. Yeah, exactly. I have done shows where everything was on the floor. It's either on the sides, on booms, uh, and that looks pretty damn cool, okay? So you can get away with, actually, if you gave me a choice, you can either have only overhead lighting or only side lighting and, and, and deck lighting, I would... <laughs> There'd be no, there'd be no thinking about that at all. Just give me the side light. That's all I need. It's a lot more interesting and a lot more powerful, and and you can still see everything. So it's not like you have to bury light on the floor, and you don't have to light the floor. That's also a great thing. Not having overhead is that your light's not going to travel 
hit the actor and continue onto the floor. And then you see all these big splotches on the floor that a lot of people, for some reason, just ignore. And that's not a good thing. I mean, you talk to, you know, what when Theron used to say all the time, we used to ask her, why do you light from the balcony? She goes, because I can see the floor. And the floor is very important. And uh, what I do is I like the light at least up on a rake, a higher rake in the back of the house so I can see the floor because you're composing the floor as well. But uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people don't teach that. I find that rather, rather strange. Um, there's also like some theaters have, um, you know, more like a symphony hall maybe would have coves in the ceiling out over the audience um, that could be used for different angle to front light, if not overhead. Yeah. I mean, yes, if they have some front of house, you know, coves, that would, you know, give you a little bit of face light coming from the front. But still, you know, the the lighting angles you can get from the side are are priceless. Well, it's not that unusual. I mean, we, we've both been to some small places in Europe and you go to these little outdoor festivals maybe and all they have are scaffolding and the scaffolding is wrapped around the stage. There's nothing overhead. There might be a fall of spot position out front and all of a sudden you've got all these PC spotlights um, on side light, side scaffolding. I, I agree. I, th- I think you can get a lot more mileage out of one side light than you can a couple back lights. I mean, it's so much more flexible for the performer uh, to move through than a backlight is. Well, you would know that because you're a dance guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I you mean, grew up in side you know, light, but, uh, which is awesome. I mean, and you go back, you, you know, I don't think CBGB's had any overhead light. I think they were all front and side back in the day. Uh, so it's not that unusual. You are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers and Sister. And today, Light Talk is sponsored by Almost Appropriate Theatrical Services. Have you been sitting at home waiting for that call that never seems to come? Are you pining for the moment that phone will ring and the voice on the other end asks you for your availability for the show of your dreams? Are you hoping against hope that someone, anyone, calls and asks you to light a freaking show? Any show, for God's sake. Well, it's time to stop whining because no one seems to want you. It is time to create your own successful career with almost appropriate theatrical services, Career Maker. That's right. Career Maker will automatically sense when you are at your lowest moment of depression and will automatically call your cell phone with fabulous career making offers. Some of our most popular messages are, Hello, Tommy. This is the late Joseph Papp. Ken Billington is unavailable, and I am calling to offer you to light the new Broadway production of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Everything Stops. Or, hey, Janine, how would you like to light a new production of David Byrne's new high seas nautical musical, Yacht Rock Madness? The show takes place on a boat sailing down the East River. Or for those especially dark, depressing days, a press of the red, I'm so ready to get out of the theater button, gets you... Hi, baby. This is Taylor Swift. I have always fantasized of you on stage measuring my lighting levels. Sure, these are not real messages, but it will sure make you feel better. Almost appropriate theatrical services, career maker. In your dreams, baby. I mean to say, you do an exceptional (laughs) Taylor Swift. You know, if I didn't know it was you, I would have thought we had spent some money and gotten her in. How about her giving out $100,000 to the stage crew? Yes, yes, That was nice. Yes, (laughs) Well, she was at the um, Kansas City Chiefs game. Kansas City. Because she's dating uh, uh, the tight end. What's his name? I keep forgetting his name. Kelsey, right. And uh, he's, uh, he's, she's dating him, and she was in the box with his mother. Now, that's a serious relationship right there. If you can sit with your boyfriend's mother for three hours, <laughs> you know what I mean? What are they talking about? That's what Lori kept on saying. What are they talking about up there? <laughs> Did you see where his uh, jersey sales went up 400% that day? Of course, day? yes. A lot, a lot of fans. A lot of fans. Oh, that's funny. Swifties. The Swifties are buying them. And now, back to Light Talk. Well, the sound of those lazy iguanas slowly crawling around Stan's patio 
means that once again, it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about where are all the assistant lighting designers? That's Where a really good thinking, question. I'm still thinking about the iguanas because, yes. you know, iguanas, if it gets cold, they just kind of semi-freeze and fall out, out of the tree until they warm up. Sad. Well, the monkeys are gone. I can, uh, I can just iguanas. see Stan running around the yard now with dropping iguanas all around him. <laughs> well, he can have outdoor solar-heated iguana pens. <laughs> Oh, maybe that's our swag this year. What, we bring our iguanas? Little baby, yeah, little baby iguanas. Oh, oh. With fezzes. I don't think we have a allowed. few. They like bananas. Um, anyway, where are you know, well, all the assistant you have, lighting you designers? Have, you have, you have, uh, hang on. Do you have iguanas in St. Bart's? We certainly do. And do you feed your iguanas bananas? Yes, we do. F- fess up. You, have you named them? No. Okay. We don't have really Name big a, ones, but... Um, some people have like gigantic ones. I mean, yeah. really huge. What is it? What is a gigantic iguana? About five well, feet. From, <laughs> like a Komodo, yes, from, Komodo dragon size? No, but from nose to end of tail, it could be three or four feet. Yeah. Yeah. Some I mean, of them get really big yeah. and they are really prehistoric looking. Yes, but they're harmless. You know, they just eat flies yes, and things they, like that. Sometimes, like if you're eating barefoot someplace by the beach, they will start to nibble your toes. Yeah, but and they, they do I'm love. They're just romantic. They love French they're fries. Romantic and friendly. Right. They love French fries. How they love French iguana. fries. Give them a right. French fry. <laughs> Where so are all, all the assistant iguanas. lighting designers? <laughs> They've turned into iguanas. <laughs> well, I was taken this week when I saw your post on Facebook that you were looking for one. Yes. You would think that people were looking for these jobs and that you would have gotten a hundred responses. Yes. I, I got a, uh, only a couple, to tell you the truth. Um, and, you know, I think this is a problem in the industry. And it's not because I'm not paying a lot of money. Actually, I, I think the fee is fair. But it has to do with people are either busy, they're in school, uh, everyone's looking for help. I mean, I talked to a couple of my former students who are, are professional designers now, and they can't find anyone. But let's talk about assistant lighting designers. I, I just think that uh, for some reason, people are having a hard time finding them. So I don't know. Uh, Steve, do you, do you have any suggestions? No, I don't. What, um, but what, why is it difficult to find an assistant? Is it that everybody wants to be a designer and not be an assistant? Or is just the industry still in a real turndown mode and people are not moving up through the ranks anymore? Well, this show, there, there are a number of reasons, and, and those are both good reasons and are affecting this uh, as well. <clears throat> the time of year is a very busy time of year in November. There are a lot of Christmas shows, things like that, spinning up. I think that COVID has driven a lot of people out of the business. I think uh, no more 10 out of 12s, uh, although a good thing, uh, you know, people are just resisting working. Do you think it's just LA? If you were looking for someone to help you light a feature film or do a television shoot, it would be different? That there would be people standing in line to work with you? I have no idea. I have no idea. Maybe they listen to the show and they realize I'm insane. They don't want to be with me for an, for a week. That could be it too. <laughs> but you said that your regular assistant is busy. Oh, they're all busy. They're all busy. They've all you know. They're all moved on. I don't do that many shows anymore. To tell you the truth, in the few shows I do, I try to find people who I've worked with in the past. But they've got their own careers. I just think that the the industry right now is kind of at a weird inflection point. There's a lot of people, at least, you know, in the classes that I'm teaching right now, who are like thinking twice about this industry. People taking a break. And sometimes we all need a break. Well, not only that, but like a lot of those regional theaters have been closing and people are doing fewer seasons and cutting down the number of plays. And maybe they're afraid there's just not a job out there. Yeah, and the, and the problem is, is that if you don't take any opportunities, you know, if you feel like assisting is beneath you or whatever, or maybe, you know, you wish to have paid the extra couple hundred bucks, by not assisting, you're like kind of losing an opportunity to meet directors and other people that could hire you in the future. 
Uh, I always taught, and I, I would assist for <laughs> whatever opportunity I could take, I'd do. You know what I mean? Just like meet directors and assistant directors, because those are the people who are going to be hiring me. And that did work out. I mean, that's how it works. You know, that's just the way the business works. So, yeah, I, I just think that now's the time that, uh, that people are thinking twice about all this. Yeah, it's very, it's very depressing. It's sort of like our sponsor. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, the people waiting by the phone for the call that never comes. That happens to a lot of people. It's really hard to be a freelancer in any business, whether you're a musician or, you know, or, or an actor or a writer. But when people don't call, what are you going to do? Just stay at home and listen to a fake call come in so that you feel better? No, you got to get out there and you've got to do something about it. And that is meeting people. Be a nice person. We talked about this last week, right, Steve? Be a nice person. And people gravitate towards nice people. And before you know it, you've got a job. It's like, you know, we really don't need a line designer on the show, but we do need an assistant stage manager. Can you do that? Of course. Now, you may not want to do it, but it's going to get you on the show and it's going to get you in the door and you're going to meet people. And that's what you got to do. And then when the lighting designer storms off, you take that's over. That's right. That's like, hey, I know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't need any overhead lights. I can do it all from the floor. Right. No problem. <laughs> so, yeah. So, assistant that's lighting funny. designers, get off your butts and get to work. Get back into that theater, damn it. Right. So, I don't yell at you, which I won't anyway. But, but I'll buy you dinners right. and I'll, dr- I'll buy you drinks. <laughs> Speaking of Anne McMills, didn't she write a book about the assistant lighting designer's yes, handbook? Did. She did. It's she like did. in its second or third printing already. I, I know. It's, it's really exciting. And I hear that Career Maker is supporting that new edition. So, you know. <laughs> in your dreams, baby. <laughs> well, maybe Taylor will call you tomorrow. Who knows? That's right. Taylor Swift. She is ready for it. So Steve has. Well, look, a, go look, ahead. No, no, no. Look, look, look at the happy phone. We don't want to end with the depressing thing. We don't want to end okay, with well, the depressing. Well, make it cheery, Taylor then. Swift phone call. Yeah. Well, look at who's look at who's signed to do the Super Bowl today. Who? Do you see Usher. 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 Is he still around? Eight-time Grammy Award winner. He's been snubbed for years at the Super Bowl. This, I mean, this is going to be the halftime show. It's in Brackley World this year. It's out in Vegas this year. That's right. That's right. They, they should have it inside the giant sphere. That'd be cool. Ellen, we need to get into that sphere. Can we get into the sphere yes. during LDI? Uh, well. You're just you're staring at us, <laughs> Ellen. So far, no. We have not been able to get a tour. But if anything happens, I'll let you know. Please, because that looks totally awesome. <laughs> I think if you told them we were going to do light talk from the sphere, I think that would open <laughs> yeah, some right. doors for you. <laughs> I think, I think Stan just, would have flashbacks, LSD flashbacks in there. You know, <laughs> you know, Paul McCartney told me never to drop names, but you tell them that David Jacques wants to see that sphere <laughs> and the, yeah, right. the door's going to yeah, open they, up. They'll swing open. That's yeah. funny. Yeah, That's kick, funny. Kick Bono and YouTube out of there. Who needs them, right? Have YouTube. light talk in there. <laughs> YouTube. They're performing that Saturday night the, right before LDI starts, too. Oh, really? Yep. Are you going? You go online. You, too, could get tickets for... $350. No, well, that's, the only, that's the only time that's the only time you two can perform. They're not going to perform on a Sunday night with, with light talk and, and, uh, no LDI going. No one will be no there. No one would be They'll there. They'll all be at the They'll convention center with us. or at the circle bar. <laughs> the circle bar. <laughs> Who wants to see Bono when you can like be at light talk central in the circle bar. Okay. So Steve has our last question of the day. Rob in Dallas asks, what questions do you ask yourself when you're starting a design? Well, I'm going to refer you to about uh, 35 minutes ago when David was talking. <laughs> I think he really covered this pretty well. You know, when I'm doing the design, I'm starting, I mean, kind of four or five questions. I'm thinking, how is the set going to be used by the director? And what are the intentions of the set designer and how I can... Uh, uh, be part of that. Uh, how much light does a show really need? When I start thinking about budgeting and how I'm structuring cues, what kind of uh, lighting 
do I need for the show? Uh, what am I trying to create on stage? And I also spend a lot of time thinking actually about color and what are the color needs for this show? Uh, and I think probably that's, that's the thing I think most about and how I'm going to incorporate the color into the show. I'm doing a silly little thing right now and I've got this big psych and I'm starting to wrap the color from the psych into the sidelight and bring that color into the show. And that's just connecting the world a little bit better for me. But I just, again, as David said, I kind of try to imagine the show while I'm drafting it, while I'm reading the play. And then I start going, what are my needs? What do I need? And then I just do it page by page. And when I solve the problems of page one, I move on to page two. David, do you have anything to add uh, to no. how <laughs> the questions you ask yourself? When, I mean, you, you, you kind of covered this a while ago. Yeah, right. Just rewind about 20 minutes and you'll hear the answer. Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> well, when starting a design, you know, it's funny because there are some silly things that I ask myself, like, okay, if I'm doing three shows at the same time, how much is this one paying and how much time should I put to this one? You know, a lot of people stack shows. They do like multiple shows at the same time. And, and I've done, I did that for years. Uh, but uh, you do have to set priorities. I have fallen into that trap. I don't know what I was thinking. I think it's because I need a new fence for my yard. But I agreed to do, I agreed to do three shows in ten weeks. That's a stupid and thing to do, that, Steve. You should know better than that. It was a really stupid thing to do. But I have to tell you, man, when the checks keep rolling in, I'm kind of excited about that. But I thought, what in the world was I thinking? Uh, because boy, you—I mean—you have hard deadlines every day at that point. There is no. Let's think about it tomorrow a little bit. It's four o'clock. I need to be putting some some uh, lead to the piece of paper right now. Lead. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think you're t you're speaking metaphorically, right? <laughs> or do you still I, I use love, it? I love I love working both ways. Oh, I have a you still go table. both ways. That's oh, man, very interesting. I do. I do. I just like the scratchy sound of the pencil and the piece of paper, and I just I just like standing <laughs> back looking at it and. You know, there's, you know, there's just nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. <laughs> it's like, it takes hours and hours and hours as opposed to minutes, minutes and minutes of drafting. I'm like cleaning out my office at school. Every day I bring home like five or six books and a lot of the production books that I've kept forever, I just throw everything out. The only ones I've saved are shows that maybe, <laughs> maybe revived, uh, but there aren't many of those. Because most of them are uh, have already reached a digital domain, uh, but a lot of that stuff from the '80s and '90s, you know, and early aughts, they uh, they were all hand drafted. <laughs> the years. They were they were hand drafted, and I threw them away. And I, I actually took a shot of one of the production books with the paperwork I was throwing away. And one of my former grad students from SMU, she posted, "Hey." That's that. That's my drafting. Why are you throwing that away? I worked on that show really hard. <laughs> she recognized it, Suzanne Lavender, and she recognized it because we did that show together in Virginia at the Virginia Opera back in nineteen ninety something. And she got, she was teasing me, but it's like, oh, I would send it to you, but it was all moldy. I mean, literally, you don't want this mold in your house. <laughs> and then you got to pay twenty bucks to ship it. I'm, yeah, I'm, I am very grateful. Do not get me wrong. I am super grateful, and it's being really useful. Frances Aronson is cleaning out her studio, and I'm just getting tons of paperwork and drawing. And I, man, I'm I'm using that in class and showing people stuff. And this is how a Broadway plot looks. But you're right; it's one thing to have, you know, the corner of my office now is just like the back of my garage with Frances Aronson stuff sitting in here. But boy, yeah, I do kind of look at that and think, maybe I'll digitize all this and <laughs> get it down to a thumb drive. Exactly. That would be exactly. great. Yeah, get rid of it all. That's what I say. Get rid of it all. Start Because when, when you retire, you want to start anew. I'm a rock and roller and again now. I'm like, you know, forget about all this other stuff. I'm just going to play rock music and soul music and, and uh, R&B. I'm very happy doing this. Are you going to play any Usher songs? No, no, no. I, I only do Kate Bush. 
I mean, Kate Bush, I will do all night long, but I'm not doing Usher. That's a damn sure. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tell us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the Snoot Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers. And sister. Coming to you from Long Beach, the tropical isle of St. Bart's with iguanas and the Republic of Texas. <laughs> iguanas are the national bird of St. Bart's. I didn't know that. No, that's the pelican. Oh, the pelican. <laughs> okay. And iguana's not a bird anyway. I know, but they turn into birds. It's I mean, a pterodactyl. Lizard. Isn't a pterodactyl no. like a, you know, I wish part they would of the know iguana they family? These ones don't. That'd be fun. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lightning shenanigans, more iguanas, and serve you more of our iguana casserole of nonsense. They're protected. You can't have them for breakfast. (laughs) But Light Talk continues to broadcast questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning for an iguana breakfast. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye.